want to invite you to open in your New Testament to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, at least as a beginning place this evening. <coughs> when you read through the New Testament, it's, it's not terribly difficult to see what kind of people God wants us to be as followers of Jesus. Paul would say here in Ephesians chapter 2 in connection with his teaching about salvation by grace, he would say that we are, in verse 10, we are his, God's, that is, God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's who we are. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, in that letter, Paul would also say basically the same thing. He would say that Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That's the language that he uses, that that's who we were created in Christ to be, a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And then Paul would follow that a chapter later, Titus chapter 3 and verse 14, by saying, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. And so again and again and again, we see that same emphasis. We are people who have been created in Christ to be involved in good works. And there's no doubt that we could take that principle or the principle involved in these verses and go in a number of different directions with it. But I want us to talk this evening about what we typically refer to, we use the word sometimes, benevolence. And when you hear that word, I, I suspect that many of us uh, probably uh, think of the, the work of the church. That's something that is, you know, we, we use in a setting like this sometimes. And there's a good reason for that, you know, although the word benevolence is not an inherently religious word, uh, it is most often used in a religious context. And it's, again, typically the way that we discuss part of the work that God has given us to do as his people. And the word itself is not, you won't go through most of the translations that we use. You don't find that word in them. Uh, it has, though, become kind of a technical term to discuss what is a, a very biblical subject, uh, an aspect of the work that God has given us to do. And so we'll talk some about that work in our study this evening, but I think we'll also find that there's more to say on that subject. It's not just our work collectively. It's more than that. And so the word benevolence simply refers to acts of kindness or acts of charity. And it comes from a, a Latin word that literally means goodwill. That's the, that's the basis of it. And so when we talk about benevolence, we're talking about things that are done for other people that stem from a desire to, to help those who find themselves in need. That's what we're talking about. And, and that desire, accompanied by the actions that stem from it, is one of the most basic characteristics of God's people, both individually and collectively. And so let's talk a little bit this evening about the obligations that we do have as a church, collectively. What, what obligations has God placed upon us? And one of the things we, we sometimes stress, and rightfully so, is the fact that we need to hold to the pattern that is revealed in the New Testament with respect to what God intends for churches to be and how he, how he wants churches to operate. And if we are to be a church that is truly modeled on the pattern that we find in the New Testament, then we need to look to what the early church did with God's approval and then emulate that in our work, in our work today. And if there's one notice, noticeable characteristic of the early church, it is their generosity when it came to this, this particular subject, to benevolence. One of the most basic observations we can make about the early church is that it was characterized by generosity, and especially as it pertained to, to taking care of one another. You know, most of the examples of benevolence that we find in the New Testament have to do with churches helping those who are part of their group locally. And when there was a need among them, they took care of it. They helped one another. They took care of their own. If you recall, when the gospel was first preached in the city of Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2, we're told in verse 41 of that chapter that about 3,000 were added to their number that day on the day of Pentecost. And the, as you continue reading there in Acts chapter 2, you find out how those people operated, what they, what they did. And so in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 beginning, talks about the fact that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. It says, and all came upon every soul, and, and many wonderful si or many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. 
And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day after day or day by day those who were being saved. Now, whatever else we might say about these verses, they, they speak to the generosity of those who first obeyed the gospel of Christ. They were willing to sacrifice in order to provide for the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ, their, their new family, as it were. I mean, they were just put together. And you see basically the same thing as you, as you go through the book of Acts. For example, if you go to chapter 4 for just a moment, Acts chapter 4, and begin reading with me there in verse 32, you see the same thing. The, it talks about the full number of those who believed. At this point, uh, had grown, uh, but they were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all, and there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There were needs, and they met them. And I don't know exactly how much time had passed between the events of chapter 2 that we read a moment ago and the events that we read about here in chapter 4. Uh, there's no real way for us to know that. You get different commentators who make uh, different guesses about that. Some think it's a matter of weeks between those two statements. Others think that years have passed. But either way, it seems to me that we're dealing with people who had not grown weary, hadn't grown weary in doing good. And I suspect the same thing could be said of the events that we read about another couple of chapters in the book, later in the book of Acts. In chapter 6 this time, I want you to skip ahead to there, and we'll start in verse 1. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. They got to that particular work. And so when we look at these verses, we typically focus maybe on what they tell us about the organization of the early church. But it says something about their work as well, doesn't it? The early church was concerned about taking care of their own, and they wanted to be sure that they did that in the best way possible, make sure those needs were met. And yet I also want you to notice that the concern and the generosity of Christians in the first century extended beyond the people that they worked with and they worshipped with, the people that they saw week in and week out and operated among. It included members of God's family who lived in other places as well. And one of the best illustrations of that, I think, is the, the money that was collected in many different churches that was collected for the, the poor saints in Jerusalem, some special circumstances as a result of the gospel being preached there and the, uh, and the fact that the unbelieving Jews would have caused problems for those who became Christians made it so that there were some destitute uh, disciples of Jesus who in some cases lost their jobs, in some cases were kicked out of their families and all kinds of things that went along uh, with becoming a Christian in the first century. Now, have you ever noticed just how much is said in the New Testament about that particular collection? I don't necessarily want us to go through everything that's uh, said about that or spend a lot of time talking about it, but I do want us to look at a, a few passages, kind of just notice them in passing. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 for just a moment. Paul there had said, uh, and we're just going to break into kind of the mid-thought in, in this section. In verse 7, he says, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And then verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do, not just poor in general, but the poor there. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16, when we talk about uh, the collection 
usually on the first day of the week, many times we'll go to this particular passage. It teaches some principles that we need to know. But the specific situation is this collection for the needy saints in Jerusalem. And so uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia. We just read about that. So you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you, whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem, he says. And so he talks about that, that same contribution. When Paul wrote the second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he will again bring up this same collection. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, also starting in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us, uh, he, he says, and he goes on and talks about that a little bit more. And so all through, you see that same thing. One more passage, and then we'll move on. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Paul will talk about that in the letter he wrote to Rome. He will tell them as he gets kind of close to the end of this letter, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, he says. And so that contribution, that work is mentioned again and again and again. This is clearly something that was important to the Apostle Paul. And so it, it's important for us to recognize the obligations that God has given to us as a church, as his people. Because we don't want to be guilty of neglecting any of the responsibilities that God has placed upon us as his people. And yet, having said that, I do believe we need to, to place this work in its proper context. Although we have obligations along these same lines, and these obligations are an important part of what God has given to his people, I do think we need to recognize that benevolence is not the primary work of the church, not the main thing, so to speak. The primary work of the church is spiritual in nature. And so when you read what is said in the New Testament, the clear message is that the primary work of the church involves things like making disciples, of preaching the gospel to people, and then taking those who have obeyed the gospel and helping them to grow up in Christ, to mature in the faith, to be the people God, again, created them to be. You know, before Jesus ascended back to heaven after he was raised from the dead in Matthew chapter 28, and uh, what we call the Great Commission. He would say to the disciples, There all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, bap uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And once you've done that, he talks about teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. You don't stop with baptizing them. You go from that point and you teach them all that I have commanded you, he said. And if we don't continue with that work, in, in, at least in principle, I get that we're not exactly like the, the apostles, but that work of, of the gospel being preached to people and taking those people who obey the gospel and, and bringing them along and teaching them the things they need to know, that has to continue. And if we don't do that, it won't get done. Nobody else is going to do that. So when Paul wrote about the provisions that Christ made for the church in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians 4, in verses 11 and following, he would say that he gave the apostles and he gave the shepherds, or the evangelists, or, well, let me restart, I got out ahead of myself there. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We can't neglect the responsibility of preaching the gospel and equipping the saints. That's the work, the primary work that God has given us to do. And the reason I wanted to point these things out is because it seems to me that in the religious world today, there is a trend toward focusing more on, on physical and material concerns. It's almost like, it, you know, that's the main thing, less on spiritual matters. 
And we need to guard against that tendency to become sidetracked by the concerns of this world, even when it comes to those areas where God has placed obligations upon us. When it comes to looking out for one another, which is the the responsibility that he's given to us, we still need to guard against that tendency to become sidetracked, to lose focus on what, what he primarily wants us to be involved in. I want you to think for a moment uh, about what we read earlier in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, we read about the the Hellenistic uh, Jewish widows being overlooked, it says, in the daily distribution. There were some needs there. There were ongoing needs uh, among the disciples there, and the church was meeting those needs. Maybe not as well as they should, which is why the situation came up. And when you look at that situation, it's clear that the apostles understood that we can't get sidetracked by, by these matters and lose focus on the things that we're supposed to be doing. And so after it talks about uh, um, this need that had arisen in verse 1, and it talks about the 12 in verse 2 summoning the full number of the disciples and saying to them, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. We can't get distracted by this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a part of the work. It's something that has to be done. But we can't get distracted, they say, from what our real work is. And so I think it just tells us a little bit about uh, where the focus is. You can see what I mean when I say that we need to guard against becoming distracted even by legitimate concerns, to get distracted from the main things that we're to, be, uh, we're to be working on. And so we have some obligations as a church collectively. But what I want us to talk about with the time we have remaining this evening is what it says about the obligations we have individually. I think this is a, you know, it's an important observation to make that we have individual obligations. And it's important, especially in a society like ours, where people seem to be ever more hesitant to get involved in the lives of other people. Have you ever noticed that tendency? I mean, maybe it's always been that way, and I just haven't. But it seems to me that that has kind of grown. And uh, have you noticed that even when we do get involved in people's lives, it's sometimes not on a very personal level. When confronted with the needs of other people, have you ever thought to yourself, you know, where, where can I send this person to get help? You know, uh, it seems to me that's kind of the question that is, that is asked on occasion. And rather than taking care of the responsibility ourselves, we think about where they might be able to, to find the help they need. And you know, it might be the church or it might be a charitable organization. It might be some kind of government program. You know, people look at all those kinds of things. Uh, and, and that's how our society looks at things. I came across an article a number of years ago that was titled, The Danger of Institutionalized Compassion. And the article pointed out that there are times when we're concerned about some cause, and, and the best course of action is for us to, to simply support that work by contributing to an organization of some kind. I'm talking about individually, as individuals. And so, for example, I'm not going to be able to go to a laboratory of some kind and do, you know, heart research. I mean, it's just not going to be a thing, right? Um, not qualified to do that. But I might be able to help by donating to some organization that does that kind of work. And that's what they were talking about, that sort of thing. And the problem with institutionalized compassion is that what it does is it has a tendency to encourage personal apathy and negligence. As the writer of the article said, if I do not carefully monitor my attitude, I can progressively become indifferent and irresponsible in my response to human need. I can develop the almost unconscious assumption that the whole of my duty toward my fellow man is fulfilled through the institutions that receive my donations and taxes. Is there any doubt that that kind of mindset is one that kind of creeps in sometimes? you ever felt that way? I don't think the Lord ever intended for every benevolent act to be carried out through some kind of organization. He did not. Not if I look at the way, not if I can understand what he says in the New Testament. That's true whether the organization is the church or some other kind of organization. It was his intention for his people to get involved in the lives of other people, both inside and outside the church. And when I look at what is said in the New Testament about benevolence, I'm convinced that much of it is really aimed at the individual. It's not aimed at us collectively. Many of the passages that talk about doing good is not uh, with the church collectively in mind. It's with me as an individual and you as an individual. And some things are are said certainly in letters that were written to churches, but what is said was always meant to be applied to the life of each of us individually. We don't have the time this evening to look at every passage 
that pertains to this subject, but I would like for us to notice a few of them uh, with the time that we have. Take a moment, let's go over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And I want us to, to notice what he says there beginning in verse 26. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows and their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, I'll just tell you, that passage is aimed at individuals. The person who is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction is the same person who is to keep oneself unstained from the world. I keep myself unstained from the world. I am to be the one to visit uh, orphans and widows, according to what James says. And so you can see that he's addressing responsibilities that we have individually. And one of those responsibilities, again, that he brings out here is to, as he says, visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Now, he's not talking about a social visit. That's not it. Now, say, I just want to drop by and visit for a moment. That's not the kind of visiting he's talking about. The purpose of this visit is to care for and to supply the needs of those who are being visited. It talks about God, uh, scriptures talk about God sometimes visiting his people. Uh, for example, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 68, would say after John was born, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He didn't just drop by. He came and met their needs. That's the point that he was making. God acted on behalf of his people. And James has that same kind of thing in mind when he talks about us visiting orphans and widows. To do otherwise, to, to do anything other than the meeting the needs that are there would, be to, uh, would, to, would make us a lot like the person that he describes in the, in the next chapter. In James chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16. When he says there, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And the point is, it's not good. Uh, that's not the kind of faith that saves James is going to talk about there. We need to step in. We need to help. And that's the same principle he's talking about at the end of chapter 1. And so did you know that this, this, this is one of the reasons why we are to work? That's one of the reasons why. It's not the only reason, obviously, but it's one of them. We work to provide for ourselves. You see that in, you don't need to see that in the scriptures necessarily. It's obvious, but the scriptures do talk about that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verses 11 and 12, it says that we are to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. You take care of your stuff is the point that Paul was making. We work, of course, to provide for our families. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul would say, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. But the scriptures also teach that we are to work so that we can help others, people who find themselves in need. In Ephesians 4 and verse 28, Paul would say there, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands. And, and you might expect him to say, so he can take care of his own stuff again. But he doesn't say that. He says, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. That's the point that he's making there in Ephesians 4 and verse 28. You know, how often do we think about that? That's part of the deal. And just in case the, the passages that we've been looking at this evening... It's in case they're not quite enough for us to recognize the responsibility that God has placed upon each of us individually. I want us to take just a moment to look at something that Jesus said along these lines. Take a minute to go with me back to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to start reading in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. What kind of visiting is that? We've already talked about it. Not just, hi, how are you doing? I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of these, the least, uh, to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister, did not serve you? And he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. You see how serious the Lord is about the things that we've been talking about tonight? He, he couldn't have been clearer about the fact that he expects the people who belong to him to be involved in the lives of other people. Christianity is not about coming together on the first day of the week, and occupying a spot, and trudging through and listening to somebody drone on for a little bit, and then making your way and doing your own thing. It's not it. It is not what it's about. This is where we come to get prepared to go out and be the people he wants us to be. That's what we're doing this evening. And so as we've studied this evening, we've talked about these obligations under the term benevolence. But the truth is that we could have chosen to use different terminology to make the same points. Because what we've been talking about is really just the demands of love. We haven't used that word this evening as we've talked about these things, but that's where, that's where benevolence comes from. That's where goodwill comes from. It's an extension of the second greatest commandment. Remember what Jesus said? Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the principle involved in that second greatest commandment applies to everyone from our brothers and sisters in Christ to even our bitterest enemy. And I doubt that we have a hard time recognizing that uh, when it comes to the former, you know, you know, our brothers and sisters. In 1 John 3 and verse 17, John would say, if anyone has material possessions and he sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. But do we recognize that that principle applies to the latter as well. I'm going to read one more passage with you this evening. It's found in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and starting in verse 27. Jesus says there, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount or more. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And so may we all come to the point where we truly learn, the tr where we learn the truth inherent in the words of Jesus that were spoken by the Apostle Paul, recorded by Luke in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. When he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We believe that. Can we see it in the way that we live our lives? 
Are we people who are zealous for good works, who have been created in Christ Jesus for that very purpose? People who, who meet pressing needs, who collectively we take care of one another, who as we go out into the world individually, we look for the opportunities to serve and to do good. So that's what we've been called to in Christ. Again, it's not just to occupy a spot. It is to make a difference in this world. Maybe we have someone in the audience this evening who's never obeyed the gospel of Christ. Maybe you've never become a disciple of Jesus. And if you haven't, I want to encourage you to do so this evening. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then, then why not? Why not take advantage of what he came into the world to provide for you? Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And you just have to take him at his word. I mean, that's not the only thing involved in it, but that's, that's where it all comes to. As a result of your faith and your turning from sin and your confession of Jesus, if you're willing to do all of that, then why not come tonight and be buried with him in baptism where you'll be raised up to walk in newness of life, a new way of living, one that is at least in part characterized by the things we've been talking about tonight. If we can help you, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.